Hey, guitar buddies, Martin Smith here. If you've ever heard the expression, tone is in the hands, and wondered what the heck that means, we're going to try and find out in this video. <laughs> So for all the practice that you do and all the gear that you buy, and I've seen how much you spend on pedals, and it's quite a lot, do you ever wonder that the sound of your guitar is governed by something else, something that you can't change, like your hands? Now, I get comments on my videos, uh, most of which are really generous, lovely, and some comments say things like, that's great, but tone is in the hands. Ah, what does that mean? Is it in mine? Don't I have tone? Is it the thickness, the thinness, the density, the weight, the size? Like, I have no idea what this phrase means, but I want to know, and I want to find out if it's going to restrict my tone. So what I thought we'd do is devise a test where me and my buddies would all play the same riff, Running With The Devil, tune you might have heard of, and we're all going to use the same equipment, same pick, same strings, the whole rig is going to be the same. And then we're going to analyse the EQ. So we're going to look at spectrum analysis, of the frequencies that come off everyone's hands. Nothing else has changed, so it should give us a really good idea of whether it's in the hands or not. Um, so we're gonna use my Dan Smith 82 Strat, the guitar I know and love. Um, it's got a Northern Ash body, maple neck, uh, Jalen Origin humbucker, which is kind of 9.8K, I believe, going for that Eddie First album vibe. And um, that's gonna go into the Breakoco 50 head, and that's feeding an ox box, which is feeding the preamps, and going to the recording. So I'll also put some Sunset Sound reverb on it because I think we need that to set the scene. Um, and that's kind of what we're gonna use as a test rig. So I don't know if we're gonna find whether tone is in the hands or not, um, but that's the thing we're gonna test. So before we get going, I think it'd be really nice to revel in all the tone that Ed made and the reasons why we're chasing this sound in the first place. I mean, like there were players in the 70s, I'm thinking maybe Aldi and Miola who played super fast but he wasn't known for his tone. Then you've got your Tony players, you kind of uh, Dave Gilmore's perhaps. He wasn't known for his technique. Now, Ed owned the whole lot. It was just unbelievable. His palette was, was super stocked with all the colours. And um, when you think about all the different styles he played, it's just amazing. So I'd like to put some examples of that for you now. Um, I'd like to use Ed's examples, but to be honest, 25 to 30 clips of Ed playing guitar is going to get me a copyright strike. So I'm going to do my best to sort of conjure up what we're talking about here with some clips. Um, please enjoy and then we'll get to the tests. Okay, first let's establish what made Ed's hands sound incredible. Let's think about all the different things that Ed's left hand and right hand did that made him sound amazing. So first off, picking hand. Oh, this is big. So Ed's picking hand is often being described as aggressive and relaxed simultaneously, which is the neatest trick to pull off. Normally, if you're aggressive, I think of George Lynch in this respect, not a disrespect to George. George is one of my favorite players, but George is very intense constantly. Um, there isn't much relaxed possibility in George's approach. He's just going for the jugular constantly, which is great. It's a heavy metal approach. Ed had more of a sort of a, a range, a dynamic range available to him. So with the picking in particular, let's think of the special things that Ed could do. Okay, first off, let's talk about Eddie's amazing ability to do the tremolo picking. Like, if you've heard Ed do this throughout his career, he was consistently amazing at it. He never seemed to get any better or worse at it. He just came out the gates being, like, devastating. Um, there's a video by a guy called Troy Grady where he takes apart the mechanics of the action. And he's calling it something called a scribble action. If you imagine putting a pen in your fingers and going side to side really fast, this is the kind of manoeuvre that Ed's putting towards the strings. 
But it wasn't just the up and down strokes that Ed could do. He could do effortlessly fast downstrokes. If you think of a track like Romeo Delight. <laughs> And if you want wild guitar playing, you need some harmonics, some side of the pick action. And Ed could deploy this anytime he liked. He could scream on those side of the pick harmonics more than anybody else did. And whilst I think that's probably hand technique, it's also probably the amplification as well. He obviously had a lot of overdrive going on that enabled the notes to just ping out. So uh, side of the pick harmonics is another great thing that Ed did. <laughs> While we're talking about harmonics, think about his tapped harmonics. He would play a tune with just tapping harmonics. Nobody did that. Like, it was such a bold move. It was kind of like, I'm the lead guitar player, but I'm playing songs as well. Uh, tremendous skill that Ed had. Continuing with the right hand, we've got his muting styles. He, Ed had a lot of muting styles. He was very, very good at just, just browning off, just muting off the resonance of the strings a little bit to keep it cool and not too wild. It was one of his special skills. <laughs> content with just playing notes, Ed would be happy to play parts of the guitar as well, like the springs in the back or the neck. And one of his party pieces was the Mean Street intro where he was actually slapping, popping and tapping like a bass player and a guitarist simultaneously. And where would a discussion of Ed's sounds be without a talk about his elephant sound, his horsey, um, the dying dinosaur, all these tremolo bar manoeuvres that Ed could do. Okay, that's the right hand, but let's not forget Ed's left hand. What a feel Ed had in his left hand. Like, the manipulation of the strings, although at fast speed, was kind of relaxed, and it was an unusual thing to be able to do a slow, wide vibrato while still doing really fast, intense playing. Um, I think Paul Gilbert described it as he was like the adult in the room. Other people would be doing a very fast, spasmodic kind of vibrato. Not for Ed. He could just rule a sort of a slow, wide vibrato despite all the intensity. Pretty incredible to have that sort of uh, relaxed confidence. There was something going on with Ed's DNA. When he trilled or did tapping, it went so fast it sort of became like a video game noise, um, a sequenced synth part almost. Um, I once saw Wolfie do this as a demonstration on an interview, and Wolfie had the same thing. Like he had that speed that went a little bit beyond most people's rendition, and it went into some sort of video game effortless speed thing. Um, pretty, pretty incredible. <laughs> Ed was always looking for ways to spice up his sounds and his technique and his ability to play pre-bends and bring the note down, pre-bends with harmonics, double stop pre-bends, double stop pre-bends with the volume down. It's a very wide range of ingredients that he could draw on. These are some examples of that. 
Another very cool trick that Ed used to do was he'd keep his fingers on the strings when moving from one position to another. Uh, most players might take the finger off, move to a different place, play another note. Ed would slide up and down that neck. It was all greasy and fluid. Um, and that joined up fluidity made it sound like somebody was constantly talking to you, constantly trying to tell you something rather than giving you little packets of phrases. Um, not many guitar players do that, but I've put a few examples coming up now. Right, so many techniques there. Um, Ed had a wide range, didn't he? And I probably forgot half of them. But um, from that, you can see that a lot of the techniques that Ed used to use are learnable. Um, I'm not saying they'll sound the same as Ed to the to the nth degree, because maybe that is the shape and size of his hands that comes into it. And we're trying to work out whether it's the playing technique, whether it's the hand dimensions, or whether it's the equipment that make your tone, and what proportions of these if it's a blend. Right, I'm quickly jumping in here because I've been given by a friend um, a folder full of outtakes and isolated guitar tracks from the classic Van Halen material. And there's something that's blowing my mind, and it's all to do with his hands, so it's quite relevant. Um, what it is, is Eddie's going for complex arpeggios, pick strikes, rhythm playing, he's moving from the top to the bottom of the neck, he's using two hands but there's something missing throughout all of that and it's screaming at me really loud. What's missing is any hand noise or mishits or handling noise or just the blub and that we all make as we move around the guitar. The zero hand noise. It's the neatest trick he could have pulled off. Like if we're talking about the skills in Ed's hands, it's even more than just the, the fiery fretwork and the cool riffs. It's the lack of noise. It's remarkable. He moves around that guitar and he never once grates the strings or squeaks on the strings. It's just notes, no extraneous material. This is possibly the coolest thing that Ed does with his hands. It's even more impressive to me now than the, uh, the fretwork. So have a listen to the isolated tracks and see if you can hear that as well, or rather see if you can't notice that as well, because it's incredible. It's the neatest trick Ed pulled off. It's super impressive, and it's the, like the final frontier for a guitar player to make no extraneous noise, just perfect notes. Um, thought I'd share that one with you because it's blowing my mind. <laughs> All right, let's roll out our subjects then. Um, we're going to experiment on these individuals and find out whether they've got different sounding hands. Um, we're going to record them all through a DI and through an amplifier at the same level. It's the same guitar and strings and pick, and they'll be tuned identically. So we're kind of ruling out everything except the uh, properties of the hands and the way the player hits the guitar. Okay, here we go. <laughs>
All right, folks, so the results are in. Before we get to that, I just want to mention that all my mates playing Van Halen sounded pretty much like Van Halen. I don't think any of them sounded like a million miles away. I wouldn't have commented that it sounded like a different guitar sound. And it's making me think of Eddie's claim that uh, people played his rig and didn't sound anything like him. It's making me see that as a little possibility of a myth. And um, certainly we know that Eddie was familiar with the myth-making process. And I like that. Like, I want my rock stars to make myths. And I want to go in there and try see if I can find any evidence for it and work out. Because it makes a richer story than if it had just said, well, I used this piece of gear with this pickup and this tremolo and this blah, blah. It'd be just a shopping list of stuff we could all do and all achieve that sound. It's much harder than that with Ed. And that's why I like it. But just to cut to the chase with this thing, Ed built a myth on this instance. He said that nobody else could get his tone out of his gear. Tone was in his hands, effectively. Whereas you've just heard a bunch of guys get pretty much that sound without having any tone in their hands. They don't play like Eddie with his tony hand movements. So it's just purely a possibility that if you learn the part and you use the right gear, you're going to sound pretty close. But hey, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. There's more to it than this. Uh, so here's the thing that I found out. So looking at the results of everyone's playing, two of the players had more bass energy in their performance. And that was visible on the frequency plots. So you could see that there was a sort of a bottom end bloom on their clips that the other players, me and Chris, didn't produce. Me and Chris produced more of a mid-range sound and the other guys produced more of a bassy sound. So I looked at the sort of hand size and the profile of each player. Yeah, so Brian was the bassiest and he's the biggest guy. He's got the biggest fingers. Second was Philippe, who's the second tallest and second longest fingers. He was also bassy. And then me and Chris, similar size, maybe I'm a little bit longer in finger than Chris, and we got more of a mid-range sound. Oh man, tones in the hands. Yeah, they've got bigger fingers, thicker fingers, and they sound bassier. So that's it. No, that's not it. I thought, let's plumb a bit further into this, because I don't want to write my fingers off as thin, weedy sounding fingers, and they're sounding bassy. So um, what I did was I took a snapshot of the EQ at the transient, the point when the plectrum hits the strings. And at that point, I had a look, and then the sustain of the chord, and then I had a look at that frequency plot. That was fantastic. So it revealed that their bass energy happened on the plectrum hit. relieved itself it just evened out and then the sustain sounded pretty much the same as Chris's and I. So what's that telling us? What it's telling us is that the transient is the thing with the bass energy, not the sustain. Now if it was their fingers, the density or the weight or some property in their fingers that was creating the bass energy, then that would sustain throughout the chord because it's still in contact and the strings are still resonating and the whole mechanism is still in play. Whereas the plectrum, bam, on. And whatever that triggers has its own sound. Right. So I looked at the pictures of Brian playing and Phil playing. Ah, it's obvious, wasn't it? So because they're bigger and they've got longer arms, their pick hand was falling a little bit closer to the fretboard than the bridge. And both of them were plucking the strings in the midpoint, maybe nearer the neck. And that triggers a bassy sound. All right, if you just move your plectrum along the string, ding, 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 do, 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 it gets bassier as you get towards the neck. That's what was happening. And that was what was revealed in the frequency snapshots. Whereas Chris and I were slightly smaller, and we also play Van Halen, so we know that if you put your plectrum in a certain place, it kind of gathers the taut sound of the string at that point and triggers the sound. So let's think about transients for a minute. Transients are essentially the moment the string comes to life, and it gives information to the listener. Like the urgency of the transient will tell you what sort of information you're getting. Um, if you play near the bridge, it's a fast, snappy transient sound, bright, and it pops out. And the further towards the neck you get, the more warm, the more relaxed it sounds. So that's the difference. Now, I looked at Ed's pictures, and you can see that Ed picks in a particular place. It's about that far forward of the humbucker. So it's pretty much like a plectrum's distance towards the neck from the humbucker. And at that point, you get the eddy sound. Why does it matter? If you're putting voltage through the strings when you hit them, 
that voltage can contain frequencies. If it contains bassy frequencies, your amp tries to reproduce those bassy frequencies in its tone. And it only has a certain amount of headroom. So if you fill that headroom with bottom end, it takes away the top end and the middle and tries to put all its energy into the bottom. And what you essentially get is a lack of mid-range. That's the last thing you want for Van Halen. You want a nice chunky mid-range. So um, it's very important to realize that where you trigger that string is gonna make a fundamental sound difference. More than that, Ed used to make a lot of inflection with his thumb after the plectrum, which creates anywhere between like a screaming harmonic or just a little bit of fur, just that little bit of grind. Ed used to do this all the time and it's what made his sound brown and rich. So if you do that near the bridge, you're gonna get very squealy harmonics. Near the humbucker, they get a little warmer. And then going to near the neck, they get very warm. In fact, the real screamer harmonics don't really live there. They live a bit further back. So if you're constantly brushing the string with your plectrum and your thumb, those overtones are gonna represent the place on the string that you're choosing to pick. And that's where the difference in sound really comes from through a brown sound overdrive. You're getting this kind of warm furry sound constantly from your thumb. So you wanna make sure that tone represents what you're going for. So in Ed's case, you're looking for that sort of harmonic area just neckwards from the humbucker by a pick, pick's width. And that'll get you in the zone. So that explains a lot about what the results were. But essentially what we're saying is that the tone wasn't detectable in the fingers whatsoever because otherwise it would show up on the sustains. It only showed up on the transient and that's purely the plectrum. The plectrum isn't a finger. So what you can say is, is tone in the hands? No, it's definitely not in the physical properties of your hands. So whether you've got long fingers or short fingers, thin fingers or fat fingers, your tone won't change. It's where you pick the guitar that's gonna make the fundamental difference to the sound that you're making. So I guess you can still keep buying equipment, still keep buying your pedals, and still keep practicing the heck out of the guitar because that's gonna improve your sound. You aren't hindered by the sound of these things. All you have to do is learn how to use them. So I hope that's been really useful. Um, it's not uber scientific, but I mean, I did apply a little bit of science to this test, so I'm quite confident with the outcome. Um, but if anyone else does more research, I'm very happy to watch it and be disproved. For now, practice away, make the most of your playing and enjoy your Ed sounds. Okay, thanks very much for watching. As you know, these videos don't make themselves, and if anybody wants to contribute to keeping the channel going, maybe buy me a coffee, or you can come to Patreon, where I've got some Van Halen stems, some outtakes, some of my tips and tricks, um, and a bit of a Van Halen hang. Please do come along. Uh, other than that, please like, please subscribe, and I'll see you on another one coming up soon. Thank you for watching. Over and out.